Thank you for finding yourself in the middle of this great conversation about gender equity. This is um, a wonderful development for all of us. This is, you are actually the only company to use um, raw data to, 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 to uh, generate these numbers, isn't that right? Not the only US company. I, the only I company believe that to be correct. On the whole planet. So I thought we should start um, at the beginning. Sure. with your journey to Davos and this wonderful announcement. I know from reporting um, for, for um, the last couple of years, gender equity is harder than it sounds in the headlines and when I write about it. Could we um, begin at the beginning, the walk before the run? I know that Arjuna played a role in encouraging this effort, but you really spearheaded an extraordinary effort of data collection, navigating privacy laws and all of that. So why don't, we, why don't we start at the very beginning? Sure. So we, we started the journey by, um, I think, first recognizing that, that we were frustrated that we were not making the progress in terms of closing those gaps that you referenced that we wanted to, uh, recognizing that we weren't alone and there were all kinds of excuses or reasons for why those things weren't happening. And so we looked and said, we've got to change the approach. We've got to change the narrative. And uh, to back up and talk a little bit about our numbers, we're a, a company of roughly 200,000 employees. And if you actually look at our just base numbers, we actually today, a year, two, three ago, um, had, had and continue to have more women than men in our company. Mm -hmm. So we could have looked and said, we're 51, 52% women, we're done. Right. But actually as we peeled that onion and you know, knowing in premise what was underneath, we knew that we really had a significant representation challenge. So the first thing we actually did is to go to the core principle around equal pay for equal work. Mm -hmm. And so the first thing we tested was that premise and we picked three countries in the world. We operate in roughly 100 countries and we picked three of our biggest countries to do that. We looked at the US, we looked at the UK, and we looked at Germany. We got some outside help and we looked and, and um, tore the numbers apart, got external validation in terms of all the numbers and uh, not surprisingly found that we were pretty close. We weren't exactly where we wanted to be, but we had a small gap we needed to fill. We went back, made those reparations very quickly. And then we went public to the rest of the firm and said, we've done this. And now we're going to go to the rest of the company. We're going to go do the other 95 or 96 countries that we hadn't done. We did those the next year. And so premise one, equal pay for equal work, mm -hmm. regardless of, of how, how, how you come at it. The second piece we then, as we peeled the onion, was really looking at, as you described, what we, we call within our firm the raw pay gap. Right. And the raw pay gap, what it really illustrates is if you have the ability to look someone in the eye and say that you're getting equal pay for equal work and you have more females in this case than males, but your raw pay gap comes back and says that your median female in the world is getting paid 29% less than your median male, it says that you have a representation issue. Right. right? And so what we did in that representation was at senior levels, we defined what those senior levels were, effectively assistant vice president through managing director, managerial positions, and then we went back and said that we're gonna peel this and we're gonna get granular and we're gonna set goals for ourselves and we're gonna measure ourselves against those goals and make sure that we close that gap. So before we get to your retention and development plan as a long time uh, leadership nerd and reporter, I'm, I'm interested in the nuts and bolts. I want to talk about the global piece because it really is a very um, interesting component. Privacy laws are different all around the world, but you're also doing this work in countries where gender rights are not even on the agenda in this way. So I was moved to discover that 30% um, of your chief country officers are women, and that includes places like Turkey and Saudi Arabia, Correct. where there's all kinds of other cultural components going on. So when I think of pay equity, I think of the, the African-American woman in the high potential pool in the Atlanta market and the ripple effects for her family in, in the community or the Latina in her first leadership job in the Los Angeles market. You know, what that change and what that investment in her is going to mean. What does it mean on a global basis, and particularly in countries where this is not on the agenda? Well, I think in, in many cases, you mentioned Turkey, you mentioned Saudi Arabia. Those are, in many cases, um, franchise changing, environmentally changing appointments in the roles. But I have to say in each of those cases, the business community, um, 
uh, the politicians, the government were extremely supportive okay. uh, of those moves. And y you can sense, you can feel right away when you go back into those places, a palpable change in terms of energy, enthusiasm, um, kind of what's going on behind the scenes in those countries. And so you can really feel, feel on the ground the change when you, when you make those kinds of moves. So um, before we get into the nuts and bolts, the bigger picture, what are you measuring? I know income inequality is something that's very much on your mind. But when you think about what the gender equity means across the board, what are the kind of the big picture um, social benchmarks that you're looking for? Well, I think first from a, from a, you know, we would start from a company perspective, and that is, does our, do our people, does our population match the consistency we're serving? Okay. Um, in this world that's got so much going on, are we getting the right perspectives? And I say, you know, I'm 36 years at our company, and I've sat around the table with a bunch of politely put middle-aged white men and had groupthink. And to get those different perspectives, and whether those perspectives are gender or race or all the things that you can bring to the table. And part of, part of what we've talked about is um, this desire uh, or this necessity to start getting comfortable with the uncomfortable. Right, that's a lot of work, I know. I'm a fan of the middle-aged white man. I, I married one, so. <laughs> but the, the constant discomfort is really the big issue. I think it's um, particularly hard for people in power. We were talking earlier and joking. One of the things that moves me when I interview people around this work is that leaders in your position have to say the same thing over and over and over again, and they have to say it with a freshness and a vitality the 75th time somebody that you've cherished that's been part of your leadership team for a long time says, this is nonsense, this is not a meritocracy. And then you say. Yeah, well, well one, it kind of goes back to you know, the, one of the books, I think it was Jack Welch wrote, that yeah. you, you, and it's a great lesson in leadership, and in particular in a big company, and you travel and you say things, and you get so tired of hearing yourself. And Jack Welch said, you say it, you say it again, you say it again, when you're tired of saying it, you say it again. When you can't stand to hear yourself say it again, you say it again. And I'm always amazed, Ellen, exactly to that point. I'll be somewhere and somebody will say, uh, you said it and I, I, it really resonates with me. And you're like, where were you the other hundred times I've said it? <laughs> right? And the, the power of communication. And you know what we call in our company, it's yeah. the tone from the top. Yeah. But as importantly, the echo back up. Yeah. Right? Because if the tone from the top comes down and there's no echo coming back up, right. it's not getting heard. Right, right, right. So you've got some big goals here. Your, your goal is to increase representation at the assistant vice president through managing director levels to at least 40% for women globally and 8% for black employees in the U.S. And that's by, by, by the end of 2021. 2021 which yeah. is coming at us like a freight train here. Yeah. And we all know that it's, you can't hire your way out of this. You can bring in all kinds of people, but if they're not welcome and if they can't figure out how to navigate mm -hmm. the system, what is your plan for this? Well, ours is, is really one that I would, in many ways, call a three-pronged approach. So when I came into my, my job of being CEO of our company six and a half, seven years ago, around my table, we had no uh, women. We had no uh, U.S. We had one U.S. minority around the table. Uh, today, we're five women. We're two two U.S. minorities around the table. And so, clearly, at the top, the tone from the top's got to be there, and making sure that we're bringing people through, promoting, running the proper slate processes, and getting the right people into jobs. But really, if you're going to solve this, and I think where at least our company, our industry has fallen short before, is is the organic, sustainable piece of it. I think we've been okay at bringing women, minorities, et cetera, into the firm, but I don't think we've created the environment that creates the sustainability of wanting them to be there. Right. So the attrition's been very high. Right, right. And so as fast as you can bring in these talented people, you're losing them because one, competition's high, but I think you've got to admit we probably haven't created the right environment that they actually want to stay and invest their careers in. And so we've tried to take that approach of getting the tone and the demographic from the top headed and publicly stated as going in the right direction, getting the balance. And this year we will be 50-50 men, women of our incoming classes. But the important piece is how do we create the mentoring? How do we create the career pathing? How do we create the dynamic within the firm where people say, hey, this is the place I've got to be. This is the place to build my career. And you cannot solve those numbers 
that we've spoken to right. simply by external hiring. Right. And, it, and, if, and if you do <laughs> solve them, you'll solve them temporarily because right. you won't have the organic pipeline that actually feeds that and creates the sustainability. So before I invite people to join this important conversation, I thought we, we could talk just briefly about how retention is different now, the sort of the modern ways that you are making sure that people are trained and engaged, which is very different when you started yeah. oh so many years ago. Oh so many years ago. I started at our, at our firm 36 years ago. It was a very, very different firm. The world was different. And, and different world. And um, I, I described that the in company's engagement around me was a methodology that I called shut up and suffer. <laughs> Right? That, that I came to work, I put my head down, you know, I, I worked my, my fingers off, lots of long hours, didn't complain about anything, you kind of did what you did. But, you know, in, in those days, and certainly in financial services, you were kind of on this rocket ship in terms of yeah. what these companies were becoming. And I started in a predecessor firm of ours, we were 2,500 employees, and we grew to over 200,000. And so it was grab the rope and hang on because, you know, if you can do anything, you know, you're going to get pulled up in this. And, and, and that was in some ways at least part of my career trajectory. Today what I describe is that career pathing is a jungle gym. Okay. Right? And, and in there, um, you know, uh, I'll speak to the financial services industry, I'll speak to our company, we're roughly 200,000 employees. We're going to continue to grow and do things, but I actually don't expect that we're going to need a lot more people. So there's not this headroom that's being created around lots of new jobs and things going on. Technology and all those things you know, will grow, but technology will continue to create some of those boundaries. And so when we talk about somebody coming in, a couple premises is one, millennials, if you're not engaged with them, it is highly likely they're engaged with someone else. Mm -hmm. The expectations are different in terms of you know, engage me, move me, challenge me, keep me steep on the, lean, on the learning curve, be vested in me. And the career conversations we often have right, are, are very different in that we try and get prescriptive fairly early and say, you may not be right, but where do you see yourself? Where do you want to go? And then we can work backwards and say, you know, if that's the job you want, you're going to need some skills. And these are the skills and these are the types of jobs. So some of these may feel lateral or they may right. not feel like big promotions, but they're essential to getting to that chair. And the great thing is, is when we go through that, we get great engagement. And by the time we get people up to where they want to go, they are far better trained, far better trained than certainly you know, I was or my generation ever was because we've completely um, curated that career in a way that gives them all the skills they need. And so I think the managers and the leaders that we're turning out today are light years better than, you know, than the old way. So um, who would like to join us? Who has, anybody have a question? I'm looking around. Hi. Yes, right here. CEO of Catalyst, um, and first of all, thanks for um, being a champion for this cause and for supporting Catalyst as well. Um, I know that this raw pay gap issue is something that is you got a lot of flack for from your peers, um, but it's also something that, like in the UK, they're requiring it. Right. What do you think the trends are going to be around this, and how do we get the understanding of this better, especially around the raw pay gap? Because I think the the um, Pay equity seems to be something that people understand on fairness. Right. But the raw pay gap seems to be a more difficult concept and something that there's a lot of pushback on. Yeah, you know, when you, what, you to, to be blunt about it, when I, having done the pay equity work and having a reasonable understanding of um, our own demographic um, and representation, I, I wouldn't say that there was a complete aha moment in the numbers. Of course, if we do those numbers, we should roughly know what they are. But I think the important piece and the uncomfortable piece around the raw pay gap is one, the magnitude of the number, right? But then it's really, in, in my mind, a, a first iteration or a, a, a first derivative event of the bigger problem. And so when you put it out there, the only way you solve that raw pay gap is by getting the demographics of leadership right. 
And so it kind of calls out the, the early issue. And then you've got a lot of work to do in terms of mapping and figuring out the right way to solve it. But it just kind of puts the, the issue right in the middle of the table and I think forces you to deal with it. And for us, it was an uncomfortable moment, but we felt it was the right thing to do to put it out there. And, um, and we'd already started the other pieces of work and we had a plan and we were implementing the plan. And so let's put it out there. Let's reinforce what we're doing and let's, you know, let's make sure we're going in the right direction. All right, we have time for one more question. Elise, is that you? Welcome. <laughs> You're gonna come. Um, I was just wondering about the um, cultural changes that you've seen. I'm sorry, I'm Elise Nelson, President and CEO of Vital Voices, and I work on women's empowerment issues. And I'm particularly interested in what you said about the government um, in some countries that you're working in around the world um, being interested in what you were doing and, and supportive. But I'm just wondering about the cultural impact of, of what you've seen. So not just, I mean, obviously it's wonderful. The pay is great. But what I also tend to think about is, how does this change the way that people value women um, in communities and countries that girls see themselves? Um, you know, do you see more women applying for positions? Is the government looking at changing legislation or actually implementing legislation that they have? So I'm just interested if you could expand upon that. Yeah, so I, I think one, one um, many things, many things change, but one thing that clearly changes is when we see and where women have gone into these and earned these positions, they uh, come in and they're, they're talent magnets, right? They're talent magnets. We've had the ability to just attract and retain great talent around having put these people in place. It happens to be that they're phenomenal leaders and they're really good at what they do, but the energy when you do that. And I would say, again, going back is, you know, I, I've been worried about putting people in harm's way and what mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. reaction of the business community or how certain constituencies. And I've got to say that I've been very, very positively surprised in terms of the global embrace that's out there. And to, and to me, that's exciting. And I think our people see it and they see the energy. And then, by the way, you know, what I talk about inside of our company is, you, you know, a bank is a risk organization. We take a risk whether we're providing your credit card or your mortgage or financing your company. And to have those perspectives, right, as we think about, and by the way, the world's a pretty complicated place today. And to have those voices around the table that look at issues rather than in the group think I mentioned earlier, very different perspectives, creates a willingness to challenge and creates a set of perspectives that I know makes us better at what we do. And I, th and I believe the company sees that and it lives it. We are gonna to have to leave it there. That was the perfect end note. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you for being here. Thank you.